Hi, my name is Mike Callahan. I'm on the music theory faculty at Michigan State University. It's really my honor to be invited here to Piano Celebration Week. Thank you to Dino Mulich and Sangmi Lim for inviting me. I really appreciate it. My title today is Making Constellations Out of the Stars, and I'll explain in a moment what I mean uh, in a little more detail. But essentially what I'd like to do is give you a guide um, toward a very specific thing, which is what you could expect from a music theory curriculum in college if you decide to be a music major, uh, how to prepare for that, but also a broader goal having to do with what theory might mean to you as a musician, how it might relate to the rest of what you do. So um, the first goal is just practical strategies for preparing to succeed in collegiate music theory courses. Most music programs, uh, collegiate music programs, require a bunch of music theory, uh, several semesters usually. There's often a placement test. Um, and while there really, in most cases, is no expectation about how much you know already, uh, that is the curriculum starts from scratch, there are some things that you can do while you're still in high school that will give you an advantage in the courses and allow you, I think, to benefit from them more. Um, and also just, I think, start yourself on a path of uh, thinking about music in a, in a broader way. The second goal is just ideas for how to make music theory an integrated part of your uh, everyday musicianship as a performer, as a pianist. So this image is one that really speaks to me deeply. The idea is if you look up at the night sky and you see just all of the individual stars, it's a lot of information, a lot of individual bits that don't necessarily relate to each other. Whereas if you learn what the constellations are, that looks like a person, that looks like a bear, that looks like a frying pan. It helps you to make sense out of groups of stars. And this for me relates a great deal to what it's like, one of, the, one of the biggest challenges actually, for a college music major. You will have individual lessons, you will have ensembles, you will have music history courses, you will have music theory courses, you may also have general education requirements. Nearly every hour you've got something else to do, and it seems to me that one of the, one of the ways that students can really get the most out of a collegiate experience is by looking for the ways that these different things relate to each other. That is to find constellations rather than just individual stars out of the curriculum that you explore. Um, and I think one piece of that is to find ways in which music theory and musicianship um, integrate with the work that you do in the practice room and on the recital stage and in other facets of your musical life too. So a little bit about me, I have been at Michigan State University for 11 years. I earned a PhD in music theory from the Eastman School of Music, um, and I'm now the area chair of music theory at, at MSU, which has given me um, the chance to, to meet all of our undergraduate students and uh, to see what people tend to know already when they come into college. Um, and also to learn something about what I wish they knew when they got to college that I think would give them uh, an even better experience in the in the music theory classes. I also, since this is a, a piano celebration week, I'll mention that I'm also a pianist and a harpsichordist, and so um, I'm aware of some of the special advantages that I think pianists have in terms of understanding music theory already. We play an instrument uh, that is very visual, that shows us the relationships. We also play an instrument that's polyphonic, that allows us to play multiple voices. So actually there are some built-in opportunities that you could do just for a few minutes at a time every day you're in a practice room. Um, and that's part of what I'm going to talk about today. So I want to take a moment first just to talk a bit about what music theory is. I, I think some students enter college with the idea that it's um, a lot of complicated terms and a lot of vocabulary to, to learn and a somewhat intimidating subject. What I'm hoping is that you can leave this video 
thinking of it as something that's actually a bunch of really accessible tools that you can work on bit by bit, um, including right now. You don't really don't need specialized training to work on music theory. So the first piece of it is building blocks or rudiments, just the basic materials of music, rhythm, meter, uh, pitch, texture, timbre, um, and if we get a little bit more detailed, things like key signatures and scales uh, and intervals and triads and chords. So these are the things that let us develop a vocabulary to talk about some of the more interesting um, pieces of music, but they're certainly a part of what you will encounter in collegiate music theory. The second big piece is analysis. Um, which I think about as consisting of essentially three things. They, they are sort of the three A's. Asking questions about music, answering those questions, and applying the answers. So let me say just a little bit about each of these. Asking questions about music, uh, sometimes that's the hard part. Thinking about what are some interesting questions we can ask. So for example, does this passage of music um, conclude? Does it have a cadence? Uh, does it come to rest? Or is this passage of music um, a single long phrase or two short phrases? Um, th these are things where the answers actually tell us a lot about how we experience the passage. Um, and so if you go down to the second bullet, it, it, answering those questions, the idea is we, we can use music theory to develop some tools for looking and listening more closely to music ways of answering some of these interesting questions. Another interesting set of questions we might ask is, uh, what's the form of this piece? How can we understand this 10-minute sonata movement um, as a single narrative or a single story? So how would you summarize it? What are its big sections? Um, there are also tools for answering th those kinds of questions. And then if we look down to the third bullet, these answers actually matter to several different aspects of our musicianship. For example, if we understand something about the form of a piece, um, it can give us a way of listening to it uh, that's longer range, things to expect that we are waiting for in a few minutes rather than just moment to moment. Or learning about the form of a piece can give us some insight about um, how we might memorize it or how we might think about it um, as performers. Those more local questions that I asked, like, is this a moment of conclusion or not? Or is this two phrases or one? Um, these answers apply to decisions like, where might we take extra time in performance? Where might we move ahead? Um, where might we connect or, or place a certain moment or make a crescendo or a decrescendo? So the idea is that analysis is a set of questions and answers, but also um, the things that we can do with those answers that inform the way we would perform a piece or listen to it or teach it um, or just understand it or communicate about it. Um, lots of different ways of applying those answers. And the third big cluster uh, in terms of what music theory is, is a set of skills uh, for musicianship. So a college music program likely will have a course sequence in oral skills, things like singing or performing rhythms, maybe performing uh, two-part rhythms, one with each hand, um, listening skills. So understanding what we are hearing, being able to notate what we are hearing, um, harmonizing a melody, improvising, which is something that you may have experience with or you may have none, um, transposing, reading clefs, um, reading an open score, and creating a simpler reduction of it on piano. These kinds of skills are, are also a part of what music theory means and what it does. So many schools have music theory placement exams. How are they used? In many cases, a school will try very hard to make sure that uh, an incoming freshman is in a class that will benefit them. And so if you have some experience with these rudiments that I talked about, scales, key signatures, etc., um, you might need less time in a course that focuses on those. If you do not have very much experience with these rudiments, you may need to spend more time with those. And so there are different models for this. Some schools have a 
a more remedial course where you meet for more hours. Maybe you have tutoring um, as well. That's one of the things that we do at MSU. Uh, there might just be different sections of the same course. Some schools don't have placement exams and group everybody together. But the goal of these is not to pass or fail anyone, but rather just to see where where people's skill level already is so that you can be in a spot that, that is beneficial to you. So what tends to be on these exams? It's different in every place, but they're, they're usually just the rudiments. So reading notes in treble clef, reading notes in bass clef. Um, I'll, I'll list some more of these in a moment. The, the questions on these placement exams typically are not, you know, write an extended analytical essay about this piece or something. That's, that's of course, something that you, you get to by developing more depth in the curriculum. But really, this is um, basic vocabulary, basic building blocks. So how do you prepare for them? Let's talk about that for a moment. This, I think, is an important part of what I want to say today, although it's not the whole story. These are some of the basics. Uh, so I mentioned pitch reading and treble and bass clefs. Um, this is something that, that pianists have to be able to do, so you have a leg up. Imagine, for example, uh, someone whose instrument is trombone and who may have zero experience reading a treble clef. There's one difference in, in experience. Or somebody who's had access to taking lessons versus someone um, who has discovered fairly recently that they are... Um, interested in singing and they maybe have fewer years of reading, you can see how there's a certain advantage that you have as a keyboard player uh, in this one regard. Maybe sometimes reading an alto clef, uh, that's, a, that's the clef that viola reads, um, and so there, it may be useful to you to, to develop some small experience in that too. So rhythmic reading, time signatures, rhythmic values, bar lines, um, just basically dealing with rhythm. This is something too that, generally speaking, pianists have to read. Uh, it's, a, it's a big part um, of, of how training tends to be for keyboard players, so you, you probably have an advantage here too. Imagine someone who primarily improvises, who may have less experience reading, uh, or somebody who primarily learns orally may have less experience reading. Three is basic music notation. So you may or may not have experience actually writing music down on a page. Um, maybe you've worked with software that lets you uh, notate music and engrave music that way. Maybe you haven't, but it's useful to get some staff paper and actually practice writing down music. Even though you've seen a bunch of it probably, it's not so obvious always to know what it looks like. So for example, do you know which side of the note to put the stems on or which way that um, how long the stems are or which notes to beam together or which way the flags go little things like that the order of the clef and the time signature and the key signature at the beginning um, so and essentially can you can you make legible music on a piece of paper four is key signatures um, 12 major and 12 minor so how do you practice this play scales, but uh, but not just as a physical habit. I think uh, certainly my my experience with scales was that I would practice them in octaves and in tenths, and I, I would learn to see keys on the, on the keyboard, but it was largely muscle memory that I was developing. And one thing that I would recommend doing is like pausing and thinking, um, can I articulate, for example, uh, which, which pitches belong to each key? Or is it just something that I'm learning implicitly? Um, and so if you can stop and actually think about it, draw a circle of fifths and think, can I systematize this a little bit? Do I know, for example, which keys have three sharps, which have four, which have five? So that's something you can practice too. Scales I mentioned, um, do these in different ways. You know, there's scales are, are useful for in a variety of ways for a keyboard player. One, of course, is, is to develop finger skills, right? But also practice these in ways that you don't usually. So practice scales in sort of leapfrogging thirds or practice scales with repeated notes. Do things that require your brain to think a little extra hard so you're not always playing them the same way. Um, and this will actually test whether you are thinking about them um, or just learning a, a pattern of fingerings. Intervals. So 
what's a major third, what's a perfect fifth. Uh, can you play any note on the keyboard and play the note that's a perfect fourth lower, for example. There's a big advantage here for keyboard players because these are so visual. Um, there actually, there's not that many, right? So there are only 12 different um, places to start on the keyboard if we don't include the octaves, right? So what's a what's a major third above C? What's a major third above D flat? You can practice this. It takes only like 20 seconds at a time um, just to noodle around a little bit on the keyboard. Like, let me play, let me start with C and E and play in major thirds all the way up chromatically and all the way down, just so you get a sense of what they look like, what they feel like, what they sound like. Um, triads and seventh chords, likewise, probably play these as part of your practice, broken chords, arpeggios. Um, but if you can stop and think for a moment, can I make one if I'm just given a name? Like, can I play G minor or can I play B diminished? Um, use the fact that you play keyboard, right? Like these have an appearance at the keyboard, a pattern of, of white and black keys. Um, so this is this list basically covers what I would think of as rudiments. That's the kind of stuff that tends to be on these exams. And so well, the point I want to make is this: these are things you can do in your daily practice. I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense to study them separately. Rather, study them while you're in the practice room with your fingers on the instrument so that you understand them in connection to what you are playing. Okay, so I want to take a little bit of an interlude before before I start talking about some other things that you can practice um, in order to develop your musicianship. So I teach a course in keyboard skills for graduate students. And it's a course that's designed to give people skills in using the keyboard uh, for their musicianship. So they learn how to transpose, they learn how to improvise, they learn how to read lead sheets a little bit. They learn how to take an open score for a string quartet or a symphony or an orchestra or something and play a version of it on keyboard. They learn to teach a little bit with the keyboard. But the important thing is that the course is not about performing piano literature. And so here's what happens. A few students each time are pianists and the rest are either non-pianists or secondary pianists. And a really interesting thing happens, which is that the non-pianists enter the course feeling pretty nervous because they have to work at an instrument that's not their own. And so that takes some getting used to. But in many cases, the pianists who come into the course haven't worked on these skills either. And this is, I think, a missed opportunity. They have spent hundreds, perhaps thousands of hours practicing, but all of it, or almost all of it, has been on repertoire. Um, playing the notes and rhythms on a page, in, in preparation for a performance. And there's no doubt that to be a pianist, you've got to spend a lot of time practicing repertoire. But what's interesting is these pianists often haven't spent any more time transposing at the keyboard than the non-pianists have. It's just something that they have never done. Or um, singing one part while playing another. Or playing something that's not written on the page, either improvising or, or sort of varying something that's written. So the point I want to make here is you can give yourself a huge advantage by practicing these keyboard related skills during your practice sessions too, and not just the repertoire. So what I want to do in the next um, several minutes is outline 10 strategies for integrating your daily practice at the piano with your development of musicianship skills. And the idea is it's like just a tiny bit every day. These are things you can do for five minutes at a time and actually make a lot of progress and develop your broader musicianship in addition to your performing ability. So let me go through these and explain. This is a little passage by Samuel Coleridge Taylor. The first is just singing. Now you may have experience singing, you may not. But use your voice. Learn to use your voice comfortably and fluently. So here's a little passage that you might be practicing. Lots of things you could do. One is just sing a, a single melody, sing the uppermost voice, or sing the bass line. Something you can often do to sort of prime yourself to notice these voices and 
and bring them out and sort of highlight them in performance anyway. Another thing you can do is sing one voice while playing another. So if you look at this passage, imagine playing just the lower staff with your left hand while singing the uppermost voice of the of the right hand. Okay, so you basically sit on your right hand and don't use it. <laughs> you, you accompany by playing the left hand part and you sing the melody. Or you can do the opposite. Play just the right hand while singing in whatever octave you're able to with your vocal range, uh, the bass voice. So the idea here is you are learning to use your voice in connection with repertoire. I think there are benefits here into um, understanding like the line, the melodic element of a piece that you're working on, but you're also learning to use your voice and sing in tune with what you are playing and all sorts of skills are, are um, incorporated into this. Here's another passage by Juan Alcorta. This is a, a piece that you, that you uh, I imagine, <laughs> hypothetically, you'd be playing as a collaborative pianist. So it's a flute part on the upper staff, a simple piano part on the lower two staves. And there are all sorts of things you can do here too. So play your part while singing the flute part as a way of rehearsing. This is like a great way of learning to be a better chamber musician because you become aware rhythmically of what the other performer is going to be doing. Um, another way of doing this is you can actually play with your right hand the flute part. That is the, the part you won't be playing eventually. Play the flute part um, while singing in, again, in whatever octave is comfortable, the bass voice. So one of the two octaves that, that the left hand has here. Um, and all of this is a way of sort of getting inside your repertoire, but in a way that um, is not just playing exactly what you are going to perform, not just playing exactly what's written for you. And you're developing your oral musicianship while also kind of getting to know and listen and, and um, dive into the piece from the inside. To transpose your repertoire. <laughs> and I wrote, what? This is something I never, ever did growing up practicing, right? Like if, if a Chopin Nocturne was in B flat minor, I only ever played it in B flat minor. Or if a piano sonata was in D major, I only ever played it in D major. But thinking back, I, there would have been huge benefit in learning to transpose pieces. I'm not suggesting that you take a monstrously difficult piece and learn to play it brilliantly in a different key. Probably you won't perform it that way. But what I do mean is take a passage of a piece, take just the melody, or if it's a complex texture, maybe just the, the melody with a single bass note rather than a whole figurated texture, and transpose it. Play a piece in, that's written in C in, in B flat major instead. This will be hard. You know, it's it's going to feel like you're suddenly swimming through through mud or something. But what do you learn from this? Think about it for a moment. You will learn to pay attention to parts of the piece that you haven't paid attention to yet. The truth is, there are lots of ways we can learn repertoire as pianists. Um, a lot of it is just habit, right? Training your fingers to remember what to do. And that's great, we need that, or else we can't learn repertoire. But it sometimes means that we learn repertoire without paying much attention to it. And so if you learn to transpose, you will notice things like um, the relationship between the two hands. You'll learn patterns. You will learn to recognize chords. You'll develop your transposing abilities. Imagine that you um, will be a, a collaborative pianist working with a vocalist who needs to sing in a different key from what's written. Um, or transposition is a great way of doing arranging. Or if you will play in a context that's not from notation, maybe in a worship ensemble or maybe in a um, an ensemble that plays for uh, weddings or for other sorts of gigs. Like there are lots and lots of practical everyday reasons why transposing is important. And the cool thing is that if you do it with your repertoire, it's actually like you have a head start because you know what it's supposed to sound like and, and, and you can do transposing in a way that doesn't seem like working from scratch. So again, <laughs> do I, don't spend your whole practice session on this. I'm not saying that you need to be able to play it as well in different keys, but do spend some time, even if this sounds a little bit silly because it's super valuable, 
Um, three, very. What if a piece were to go differently? <laughs> Play four measures of a piece and then stop for a minute and say, I wonder what would happen if the melody were to have 16th notes instead of just eighth notes. Could I make that happen? Or I wonder what would happen if the phrase got as high as this C instead of only up to G. Or I wonder what would happen if there were a different chord at the beginning of this measure. Or I wonder what would happen if. Basically, this is a what if game. You don't have to compose something that gets published. But the act of messing around with it, of playing in the sandbox, um, will change your relationship to repertoire. And I can't highlight this enough. When I was practicing piano repertoire as a kid, actually even not as a kid, as a young adult too, um, I felt like my job was very much in service of the score. You know, it was the boss and my job was to uh, transmit it. And I think that we can, we can give ourselves as performers, as musicians, some more agency than that by saying, you know, we can actually imagine some other ways this might have gone. Um, so try that. And I, I think what it will do over time is make you an equal partner with the composer. Um, that is, you could imagine making music that was like this. Is that what you might perform? Maybe or maybe not. It would be great if you performed a piece that you composed on, on a recital. But it doesn't even have to go that far. It's more just about um, being able to have a voice and um, not just feel like you're in service of the notes that are on the page. Plus, this is a lot of fun. This is the kind of thing that I will sometimes plan to spend five minutes on and actually end up spending half an hour and having a great time. So that's a fun thing to try, too. Four, learn repertoire orally. If you were trained in a Suzuki method, you may have done this already. Uh, but otherwise, at least in my experience, this is not a way that pianists tend to learn music. And the idea is if you want to start a new piece, don't start by opening the score. Find a recording, or better yet, find five different recordings. And listen intensely. Listen at a keyboard pause the recording and try to play what you just heard. Listen to just a chunk at a time. Uh, try to play along while you're at your piano. And the idea is you, you may or may not be able to get as far as the whole texture, but what you, what you are aiming for here is to develop an image, an oral image of what this piece is, and also an ability to play through it, or at least play its melody or try to play parts of it before you open the score. It changes your whole practice process. Um, what, one thing that I notice with, with my students and also myself, if the first encounter I have with a piece is through the score, the actual act of reading often gets in the way. You can only read so much information. Um, and so it takes a long time to really get a sense of what a piece is, what it sounds like, how it feels in your hands. And so imagine the other way around where you have an image first because you've listened and played along, but then you go back and look at the score and just use it to clarify. Oh, right, so the composer has indicated this articulation, this phrase marking, this dynamic. The chord is voiced in this way, um, and you're using the detail to sort of fill in a basic shape that you already have. For me, the, the best metaphor for this is like, if you want to draw something in a lot of detail, Imagine you want to draw, for example, like a really detailed landscape of a forest. You could start like in one little corner of the page and, and draw a very detailed tree with all of its shading or whatever, and still <laughs> not really have any idea of what's next to the tree. Like you don't know if it's a river or a rock or whatever. And this is very much like reading a score. You know, you start with like the first measure of a score and all of its detail, it's a lot to take in. Whereas if you learn a piece orally, it's more like just sketching the outline for a whole drawing. You know where stuff is, and then later you go back and layer in the detail and the color, and that's that's like adding in a score after you've learned it orally. This is a great way of building your oral musicianship, and it's something that I would recommend trying. Five, lead sheets. You may have experience doing this, and you may not. Here's just the first page of a lead sheet uh, for Moon River. 
It's a song by Johnny Mercer with um, the, the lyrics are by Johnny Mercer and the music is by uh, Henry Mancini. So this is an interesting experiment. If you can find a lead sheet that actually has a piano part written out like this, it's pretty interesting because what you can do is learn in two stages, right? So there are chord symbols on the top. C stands for a C major triad. Uh, the next chord, A, with the little M, stands for A minor. It's a good way to practice fluency with just what, what chords are. But the first time through, you can play it as written. Play the bottom two staves, which are fully written out piano part. But then, once you can do that, cover those over. Uh, you know, staple another piece of paper to them, or if you're reading digitally, like white it out <laughs> with, uh, with a, a white box or something. So now all you have in front of you is just the melody and the chord symbols. And now you're responsible for coming up with um, something that sounds decent to play on the keyboard. Like you, ha you know what notes are in a C major triad, C, E, and G. How can you arpeggiate them? Or do you play a repeated chord? Uh, or do you play just the bass note on the downbeat and the chord after on beat two and three? Sort of infinite ways to do this. But the skill you're trying to build is really two things. One is just like decoding the lead sheet symbols, translating the C to a C major triad. The second is developing a knack for um, playing simple accompanimental textures on the piano um, without reading them note for note. And this is hard to do if you've never done it, but it's a skill you can get much better at in actually not that much time. Um, listen to recordings of people playing a whatever whatever tune you choose and the idea is you you can untether yourself from notation quite a lot um, and learn to read either from no notation at all or just read from a little bit of um, a melody and chords so this is a whole endeavor that I think is super exciting and valuable for a pianist who wants to be uh, versatile and and be able to play in more contexts than just repertoire from notation. Six, harmonized melodies. Melodies that come from anywhere. Uh, folk tunes, you know, tunes that somebody might have sung to you as a kid or that you sing to other people. Um, but take a tune you know, but that you've never seen written. Um, sing it, figure out the melody, and then add chords. There's a lot of vocabulary for how to harmonize, what kind of chords to use. That's something you'll learn as part of your music theory curriculum in, in college. Uh, but I think actually it's okay if you try this even without much vocabulary. You can, you can start off by saying, all right, this melody is in C major. I'm going to use only C and G in the bass, one and five. Um, and use your intuitions and your oral instincts to start and experiment. I think the name of the game here is the act of experimenting and exploring rather than trying to play by some specific set of rules. Um, some, some of what we do in collegiate music theory is like learn to emulate a style in a specific way and so there are more specific kind of exacting things to do for how you harmonize but I actually think that's not something you have to deal with um, at this stage in your careers. Just try stuff. Seven, so I had talked a little bit about Analyze before. Um, ask questions about the repertoire you're playing. How many phrases are in this section? Uh, does this phrase end here or there? Where's the moment of conclusion? Which harmonies add tension and which ones resolve tension? Just stop and think a little bit. And then the idea is use the apply section too. Don't just ask questions and answer them, but ask the so what question. Okay, so this, this harmony adds tension and the one after it resolves tension. What might that suggest to me about performance? Maybe I grow and, and make a crescendo into the chord that adds tension and make a diminuendo out of it as it resolves. Uh, or maybe I create an acceleration so the musical energy increases into the more tense chord and then a relaxation and a slight um, pause or slowdown or something into the resolution. So the idea is Ask the questions about pieces, but but see if they tell you anything about choices you might make as a pianist. Eight, uh, chant rhythms while conducting. If you have never conducted, it's a valuable thing to learn. You can watch YouTube videos um, 
of just really simple conducting patterns in two and three and in four. Um, why do this? So we practice with a metronome. I was told as a kid, practice with a metronome really reliably. And I think I misunderstood what it was supposed to do. I thought that a metronome was going to fix <laughs> or teach me how to play rhythmically. Um, and it really doesn't do that. A metronome shows you, it diagnoses problems that you have with your time. It shows you when you're rushing. It shows you when you're dragging. It does not help you to not rush or not drag. What you have to do to do that is subdivide. If you're playing a phrase in quarter notes, be ba 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 ba. If you want to play it rhythmically in time, you've got to be thinking ba 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 ba. So develop a sense of internal subdivision. Imagine an, a very short rhythmic value that you can hear in your head the whole time while you play a slow phrase. And in fact, the way to work on this, it's paradoxical. You think, well, if I want to get better at rhythms, I should practice hard rhythms. No, you should practice really slow melodies, like half notes, and work on doing them rhythmically in time. Now, will you perform them in a metronomic way? Probably not. You will probably perform them with some rubato and some stretch, but that should be a choice, right? You've got to be able to perform them perfectly evenly so that you can, so that rubato is an expressive choice and not just an accident. So um, you can you can do this in, in several ways. Take rhythms in your pieces and sing them while you conduct. Take a rhythm from the right hand and sing it. Um, while you tap a rhythm from the from the left hand and let me show you what that one is it's actually the next idea that I have so here's a piano trio by Louise Ferenc it's a piano is in the bottom two staves and the and the other two instruments are violin and cello and so imagine this passage um, starting on the top system the last four measures so there's lots of rhythms going on here the cello has straight quarter notes, bum, 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 bum. Violin has bum, 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 bum. And the upper part of the piano has the syncopated rhythm, b, ba, ba, ba. So how can you work on this and develop your time? So do different combinations of singing and tapping. So I'm or um, I'm going to try doing singing, or really just chanting that upper line of the piano while I tap the violin part. Ba, 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 ba. And I can add a layer to that. Maybe now I tap the half note part from the piano while doing this. Ba, 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 ba. And you can do this slowly, do it with a metronome. But what you're trying to build is a sense of rhythmic flexibility. So you can jump around in a score. This will make you a better chamber musician, a better collaborator. Um, it'll help you to play like a trio member as opposed to playing like a soloist with two other people on stage. Um, and it'll also teach you a way of listening, paying attention to more different rhythms at, at once. Just be creative with this. The idea is if you're preparing this for performance, you might look at this section and say, oh, those four measures are really easy. It's just quarter notes and sort of gloss over them. But actually to get this together with collaborators is not trivial because of the syncopations. And so you can do this kind of practice on your own that actually pays off down the road with the, with the other two collaborators. Um, and 10 is really general. Listen to music that you might never play. Composers whose pieces you've never played. Styles that you don't play. Um, I had a teacher who told me as a kid, and I was so grateful for this, listen to um, a piano teacher who said, you know, listen to great violinists, listen to great singers, the way that they phrase or something. That's part of it. Like just develop a sense of sort of what musicianship means in other, for other instruments. But also listen to musical styles that you, that you haven't listened to before, um, that you maybe have never been exposed to. There's... Uh, I think it's it's never a waste of time to listen and pay close attention. Um, and this is something that, that I hope your college music theory curriculum will give you a chance to do too. Um, my, it's it's, a, it's a, a 
wave of change that's kind of happening now that's in a really positive direction and I think needs to go even further to broaden the scope of the music that we pay attention to in undergraduate curricula. This is something that you can start with at home. Um, even if you're assigned kind of traditional repertoire by your teacher, um, use your listening time on your own to um, to see how far you can go in, in exploring pieces and in, in, uh, composers that you, that you haven't seen before. And I know I said there were 10, but here's number 11. If you have a chance to take a music theory course, um, do it. You may have a, a chance at your high school. Maybe there's a music theory course. Maybe there's AP music theory. Uh, maybe there's a community music school near you. Maybe you don't have access to these things or can't afford to do them. And, you know, that, that will be true for a bunch of people too. So I don't want you to feel that you're behind if you don't do it. Um, but I think being curious and within whatever resources you have is a, a good idea. So a conclusion, um, I hope that this gives you a sense of what you can expect to learn in collegiate music theory and oral skills. Um, but also I hope that it gives you a sense that there's no need to wait until then. You can start now practicing every day, doing some of these things for five minutes, five minutes in each of your practice sessions. And um, what, what I think this encourages us to do is to define musicianship in as broad a way as possible learning to do a bunch of things and developing our hearing and our singing and our rhythm and our time and our listening um, in addition to our piano playing and in thinking of all these things as part of an integrated musicianship. And finally, um, to grow, you have to stretch. So what? To, so to get better at this stuff, uh, you've got to practice in new ways, listen in new ways, ask new questions, explore new music. Um, and I hope that I, I really wish you the, the very best, regardless of whether you decide to, to be a musician professionally or just as something that you love for your whole life. Um, these are lifelong projects, becoming better musicians. It's something that, you know, you don't accomplish in a week. And so start now. <laughs> and that way you don't ever have to be in a hurry. You just work on it a little bit every day and chip away at it. So thanks again to Dino and Sangmi for, for inviting me to speak with you and I, I wish you the very best in your future musicianship.